Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Answered Podcast. My name is Pavel Buja, and I will be your host, and I'm joined by my fellow host. Hey, my name is Sebastian Kalemba, and I'm game director for Polaris. And what we'll be doing here, we'll be taking our awesome colleagues from Teda Project Red, and we'll be putting them here in those chairs, and we'll be asking them questions about their inspirations, about their work, how they do things, what makes them tick, and we'll have awesome episodes. And the first episode is a banger. Yeah, man, we are starting with a bank because today Marcin Blaha, VP, Head of Story, gonna join us together with Tomasz Marchewka, who's our story director. So we're gonna talk about everything story. Let's not wait, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Answered Podcast. And uh, we, me and Sebastian were thinking, how do we start these things? Because that's always, it's always difficult to start. So we'll start with something very, very basic. How long have you guys been in red? Because as far as I know, you've been here quite a long time. Yeah, for me, it's almost 70 years. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm stunned. Uh, it's an easy count for me. Uh, it's almost 10 years, but I think by the time we're online, it's going to be more than 10 years. Damn, that's that's quite a long time. That's quite a long. But how do you feel about this? More time, more 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 years to come, or how do you feel it? Well, uh, right now, like I think, like the more the merrier. Uh, it changes. It changes. Like I think, like if I divide it to, if I am to divide it to cycles, mm -hmm. it will be like three year cycles because it, it switched. Yeah, from like the first two or three years is learning. Uh, another three were like properly doing stuff and then switching to leading the team and then it goes further, yeah. Yeah, and I'm waiting for my gift for uh, 20 <laughs> year of, years of employment, so, and then we will see. Jesus Christ, 20 years. Full mm -hmm. year. Yeah. I've been and here yeah. for eight years. Uh, you've been here? Almost 10 years. Yeah, yeah. so that's that's quite a, quite a long time also, yeah. I think we're already like moving into the, like me semi-veteran, but you guys like veterans of the of the industry for sure, yeah. So let's talk about the business, guys. Yes. We have some, a few questions about story in general because we are experts here. And we are wondering for you, like what it is really to make a story like, really captivating? <laughs> I uh, it depends. Uh, I mean, when we are talking about games we make, uh, usually it's like a um, complex, system of things and uh, I would say that usually characters are the most important thing uh, when it comes to the story but um, you know story is about directing emotions so whichever tool is needed you know to do it so we use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah adding on top of what Marcin said I think uh, like I was to say emotions emotions are the most important thing in, in, in like whatever medium you've got. Like when you want to tell a story, you want to have emotional reaction. And we as writers, like we, we use words, we use scripts and so on, but basically script is a basis for whatever you have. It, it can be visual and can, it can be based on sound, but basically it's a, it's a mix of things that add up to, to give you an emotional reaction. And uh, the story is a background. It's a kind of a, of a pillar that sets you, sets you the, the sign like you, you're heading to, you know where you're, for what, which emotion you're going and and then we add up things to, to, to achieve the goal. Yeah, and I feel like I don't want to toot our own horn, but we kind of are known for evoking a lot of emotions in our games because I, I remember I used to work on the community side and that like the most important quests that we had in the game were the ones that either made people cry, made them like, you know, just like think about if the choices they made were right, if they were wrong, there's consequences to everything that you do. And they always like second guess, maybe I should have done this. Like we still have the 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 thing that people talk about is like, which ending is canon, which ending is not canon. And this applies also to cyberpunk, it applies to, you know, any game that we do. So I think it's a, it's an ongoing thing, right? Uh, absolutely. And to be honest, I, I just reminded myself uh, like one of the first big statements I've heard here when I joined Red, was, you know what, story is a king here. Yeah. And every sim single simple thing like follows it. And I also wondering what, what's your take on it? Because I believe it is, I believe it is, uh, and, but how, how do you, it's a, also uh, mm, a big responsibility, right? For, for writers here uh, to set up emotions, one thing, but still some other areas also are following you guys. 
It's a, it's a difficult thing to, to define because uh, it seems like everything starts with a script and that's not entirely true. Like setting the pillars for the project, even the emotional pillars, it's a collaborative work of the whole narration, not only. Mm -hmm. Like you want gameplay to support it, you want art to support it. So basically it starts with a high level discussion of things that's going to add up to the story, like as we've mentioned before, but it's not entirely dependent on what writers will do or a specific writer will come up with. It's a more like a collaboration of a high level, like people responsible for high level vision. And then it's going to be translated into a proper story, which then is going to be translated into many, many things and so on and so forth. So basically it's a, it's a mix of things and it's a, it's a boiling pot. Yeah, and uh, when you play the game and when you experience the story, it is not not only writing. You also experience um, uh, like a visual narration, or uh, you know uh, even small movements in a character animations. They also contribute to you know telling the story. Um, as Tomek said, sound and music, uh, it's quite complex and uh, we provide one of the elements of this complicated machine. But I kind of feel like all those things need to follow the story. Like emotions, yeah, they can be, you know, portrayed in a way where you're showing emotions with facial animation, right? Yep. You also know a lot about animation. Yeah. Um, body, body language is a big thing, but also the, all these things and the music, they need to tie into the story because, you know, you, you can have a moment which in the story you're trying to tell something which is kind of like solemn, sad. So you can't have upbeat music or it needs to kind of follow the same artistic style. So there's, there is a point where all these things need to come together. But I feel like the story is kind of setting the the base like because that's that's what we kind of start off with we we have you know a blank page which we fill up with text and we get the basic of the like a basic story and from that point on we start building off of it and then quests come in animations come in visuals come in because i feel like a brief is always something which is typed out right yeah yeah but also i believe that like you know paper solves everything yeah. you know uh and so it's a really iterative process and within the iterations uh kind of trying to find out the one root cause for all the other areas. Martin mentioned about characters, main emotions and stuff. And uh, I would like to uh, ask you guys about, um, there's always this main theme or a few themes, but how do you, how do you kind of continue working on it when it comes to the quests? Because then we have like 30 quests, let's say, that at some point they need to really complement each other. Uh, so this is the question, how, how do you think about this process uh, from that point of view? And the second thing, the iteration. How do you perceive iteration? Because um, it is a very iterative process, right? And you have to like kind of uh, has enough stamina to yeah. go through it, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, so um, before I answer this question, I want to mention one thing, because you said that uh, it starts with uh, words written on paper, but actually it starts earlier. It starts with talking about, you know, like abstract entities, about, mm -hmm. you know, r relations, about, you know, uh, some vague ideas, about, you know, uh, some tropes. And uh, when we talk about it, sometimes it's, uh, like, you know, like a Chinese room, uh, because uh, uh, if somebody could hear us, it's like, you know, talking with uh, with, uh, with a coat, you, you know, like <laughs> twins having this special language. Abstract ideas flying exactly. around. Crazy philosophers yeah, in the room. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, but it helps, uh, it helps us a lot. And in fact, it is foundation for everything that comes later, that is for writing and for what you said, uh, for all this iterative process, because um, if we have in our minds um, what we are up to, uh, then we know how to fix things and, you know, how to iterate them and how to make them better all the time, all the time having this, you know, initial idea on our minds. And if the proof of concept so shows that the idea was wrong, we start from scratch and, you know, we re rework. Yeah, and as you've mentioned, interactive process, like I think what sometimes happens and it's very difficult to untangle out of this situation is when uh, we lose the, like, like the, the idea comes out of our sight for a second. Like because of so many iterations, you forget what was the first idea. So you need to remind yourself what was the 
leading emotion. Once again, like you, you've, you've got this light in a lighthouse and you need to re remind yourself what is it. So for example, it doesn't matter how many iterations we're gonna have, but you need, for example, to remember that it is about that like, un inevitable fall of a character because of their flaws, for example. And if you if you remember that, no matter how many iterations you have, you still need to ask yourself, is it still about it? And when it stopped to be about it? And or because sometimes it's okay to stray for a second and then come back to the main topic, but still, and it's it's even more difficult because we are doing open world games which are non-linear and so on. So so basically, this is this is the tricky part of the process. Do you feel like there's a moment where you need to kind of stop and then say, okay, this concept like won't work. Like we need to go back to the drawing board, think about like the emotions that we want to convey, or kind of think about the direction you want to do and go all the way back and say like, okay, we're doing this differently. And does this come out in a way through the process, like through iteration, 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 we're like, no, initial idea doesn't work. We do, will do it like this right now and we'll test the idea. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Mm, yeah, yeah, it happens very often. And um, in fact, we are like running simu simultaneously uh, many quests mm -hmm. and uh, all the time we are testing them. And if something uh, doesn't look good, we just fix it. And if something looks promising, we just, you know, uh, green light it. Uh, so um, it's like, uh, I mean, when you have a project and when you are um, keeping um, up the story, uh, it's like a constant state of awareness and, you know, um, paying attention if all the elements, you know, actually put together mm -hmm. and uh, if something is flawed, you replace it. Um, you've mentioned about the light in the lighthouse uh, and I really like it because for some, like story is a king can sound like a constraint. You know, like, yeah. what do you mean? Limitations. Yeah, right. like, let me let me design my gameplay the way I want and stuff. But then, you know, in the end of the day, it simply doesn't work or, for example, doesn't meet their, let's say, character, emotional, uh, say, or any requirements there. And it sounds like a constraint, but actually, personally, I perceive it as a, as a light in the lighthouse that sets up the direction and... and uh, it's, it's very refreshing very often in the, like, to get back to the story every single day make sure that it fits and uh, it's coherent and um, this setup actually um, makes your guys your story like very organic uh, collaboration it makes this collaboration very organic within other disciplines and i'm wondering how do you as story writers like collaborate with gameplay or even more technical uh, departments there's one thing I think which is important to mention because uh, it's there's one thing we haven't talked about, which is uh, one tricky part of the process when you are running in circles, not because of the things that are there, but because of the things that are not there are not and you there, do yeah. not know about it. Because it's one thing having some kind of assumption, work like working with it, and then it turns out to be impossible, then you get another one. The problem is when it doesn't work and you don't know what to drop or what's the what's the big thing that should be there but is not. And this is running in circles. This is this proverbial moment when you've got a ball and you bounce it back of back of the wall and then you you try to find the the, the spot. Like basically, you need to understand what's not there and it should be there. So this is something which is uh, which also happens a lot. Like in from my experience, this is the one of the most difficult moments when you need to define not how to change things but what you. What you're missing, like yeah. all the what time. you need like, to add in order for the whole thing exactly, to, exactly. to, you know, paint a picture. Find additional layers. So, but going back to to, to gameplay, I think uh, uh, it's a difficult. I, I think for me, it's a difficult process because uh, I'm, I'm. For me, it's difficult to think in a visual way, uh, and that also transfers to action and actionable things and so on. I, I find it really difficult. So, uh, I always. Uh, like I, I prefer the conversation. Like I, I assume that I don't know much about their stuff, even though I do. But basically, <laughs> I, I come with the assumption that uh, I, I'm an ignorant and I need to ask a lot of questions and provide whatever I can give them to help them. So I, I rely on the conversation of asking questions and then uh, like merging our expertise. Because because uh, yeah, for for me it's very difficult to go out of the of the comfort zone of the of, of letters and of pages of dialogues and so on and learn to transfer it into visual language and to to the verbs, gameplay verbs and so on. Like I, I think this is the 
some some kind of transformation. I'm, I'm in, in the middle of right now. I try to learn that uh, by by researching, by talking to people. Like this is this is my personal development right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, I think that uh, obviously we are um, the writers, but uh, first of all, we are game developers. And um, when you develop a game, it's always a teamwork. So uh, talking to people and discussing stuff is like a huge part of game development. So uh, if you are a writer, it's part of your skill to, you know, to communicate to people, to listen to them, to discuss everything. And then you you can be sure that you are doing like a, you know, a complete game, you know, that uh, what you are doing fits everything that other people do. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, Yeah, actually, let me, let me follow it because uh, I'm super glad you said that, that you are also guys, first of all, you are game developers because uh, coming from, let's say experience, sometimes uh, people tend to forget about uh, you know, and they kind of silo themselves. But as soon as you silo yourself, then you are in your discipline. And instead of like remembering about the experience uh, that that you are trying to make a best concept of best whatever, right? Uh, and in the end of the day, you have a pot, you play the game, you need to feel this character in words and also in action. And, and that makes the whole experience super coherent. Uh, so yeah, we're all... I believe, yeah, we're all yeah. game developers, which is awesome. I'm happy that you said thing, the thing about the silos because you can sometimes think that, you know, a writer is a person that only writes and sits down and just, you know, puts everything into text and kind of provides it to the other teams and they kind of sit down and it's like, okay, and now we need to make something out of it. But it's a, it's a iterative process in the sense where you go back and forth and you actually talk and you discuss and you kind of, you learn from one another in order what to do, how to do it, what to change, what to cut, what to add. Like it's a it's an ongoing iteration and that's really cool. And also games are a specific medium because you don't read a game, you play a game, you interact with it. So you're, you're hands-on experience. So it needs to be like the storyline as well as the quest, as well as the gameplay, as well as everything needs to be kind of, you know, one-on-one to the player so he or she or they can experience it in a specific way yeah absolutely yeah i I like this analogy with music and so we are a band and i'm playing guitar and but i have to listen to other instruments and we are making a song together and then there are some people who are listening to our music and they um, experience it and they have like their own uh, interpretation of the music but we have to listen to each other to provide the best experience possible. I'm happy that you use the guitar because guitars can also do like sick solos, so like a sick guitar solo. So you can have this place where, like you said, story is king. So you can have it as a, as a, as a big thing. But do not forget that, you know, everybody's kind of building up to, to, this, to this moment. Yeah, totally. I um, consider myself a trumpet player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. You're you a big fan of jazz, so yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, it's it's consistent. It's consistent. Yeah, it's difficult. I heard. I can play, play any instrument. So <laughs> yeah. I can dream. Yeah, trumpets I think are are quite challenging. I remember as a kid, yeah, I I, I didn't want to try the trumpet because it was it was too difficult. Although it has like three or four buttons, it should be easy, right? But apparently it's not. But <laughs> what, what kind of instruments you play, dude? I play the clarinet. Mm. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. I had more buttons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that was probably the appeal. Yeah. 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 I love drums. So. Well, okay. <laughs> nice. Okay. We got a band then. Yeah, yeah we, we got, got a band. Nice. Nice. Let's, yeah. Let's yeah. Kind up. of all over the place, but a band. <laughs> <laughs> Next Christmas party, guys. We're, gonna... yeah. Yeah, we're doing it. We're yeah. doing it. <laughs> all um, right. Do, do we want to move to characters? Because you mentioned the beginning that characters are very important. And I remember we were having a conversation, we are working on the script for this episode, that one thing that you said that kind of stuck in my mind, and, it's, and, and you guys mentioned it in the beginning, is that characters are catalysts for the story. So big characters, important characters, memorable characters, characters that sometimes for us as players divide us in the sense of like, love him, hate him, lover, hater, or who is this? Like, this is a totally bad person. No, this person maybe is not that bad. There's like shades of gray. So how do characters work in a story? Like, are they the the, the main focal point when, whenever you're writing something or designing something? They are. I mean, uh, there are many ways to um, create a story, but uh, I think in our games, we... Um, 
in our game, our games are character driven. So mm -hmm. first of all, we are thinking about the protagonist because the protagonist is um, like a gateway for the player to the game. And then about the NPCs because uh, through this gateway, uh, the player um, starts some relations with all those characters. Mm -hmm. And that's how we um, craft emotions by interaction, you know, in game. Uh, and then we put them into trouble and things happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually had this discussion once that on a, apart from the protagonist, which is one of the most important things, the main driver of the game. So yeah, it is character driven in that sense that actually our games on a high level are plot driven because we construct the plot in a very planned strategic way. But then within the plot, specific spots are character driven. And this is the mix of two things. Like the structure is really strong and is driven by, by the plot. But then within the plot, the, the characters take over and the plot, of course, is being changed to, to, to express the characters in the best possible way. So like we are a mix of both, depending mm -hmm. on the level you analyze the, the work. Cool. Um, and I have a follow up to this yeah. because you said also at the beginning regarding captivating stories that we do we create emotions here and protagonist is a catalyst, it's a gateway and right. But the, all the other NPCs, I mean, main NPCs at first, uh, they are, they are like, I would say human beings and we, I mean, players, we have to kind of get into the relationship with them. And emotions, right? And the character is the also getaway to it, just to make sure that we can identify, we can relate to characters and stuff. So I'm wondering, and it's all about emotions, I believe here. Um, but um, what's your take on it? Like your favorite characters in our games, and why? Oh wow, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a big one. That's a loaded this, one. This is this is this is the most difficult one because uh, I uh, I think I'm mm, mostly con emotionally connected to the characters I worked on. So mm -hmm. it's more of a you know creators love hate relationship than having them analyzed as a player or a consumer of the of the medium because uh, uh, I don't play like I play our games uh, mm -hmm. once or twice and okay. a lot uh, like a lot during development so basically when, when you're like I think C cyberpunk is a good example I think I I finished the game like five or six times before the release so after the release I basically some stuff changed in the process but I have, I, I put it on a shelf and wait some time so like the the, the proper experience mm -hmm. uh, happens years later so like I, I think that the, the examples are not the the most obvious ones because I'm connected to the characters that I worked on the most uh, because of the story attached in, like story in my head mm -hmm. attached to them during development. So uh, in The Witcher Three, for sure, it's, it, well, this is, I think it's surprising. It will be Anna Hendrietta. Oh, okay. Because uh, there was a lot of discussion about her, her mm -hmm. character, who should she be, and so on, and her. Uh, the leader of her guard, which was like, he's got minor role. He's called mm -hmm. Damien, Damien, but like, yeah. yeah, he was present during the during the talks, so, like, the, and that love, of course. So like, the, 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 this trio of characters, like, we put a lot a lot of work into them. You like, you need to know all that stuff to be able to write them, but it's not visible on the screen. So, uh, and of course, the characters that didn't make the cut also have a special place in my heart. Uh, in Cyberpunk, for for sure, my son Jackie Wells. <laughs> uh, yeah, I consider him my son. Rest uh, in peace. <laughs> yeah, I, I killed my baby. Like kill your baby skill. I heard is important. Uh, and Pan Am, I think Pan Am as oh. well as well. Uh, although favorite, yeah. although uh, the character I I haven't worked lot on, but uh, is one of my favorites is Rogue. Like I love Rogue. I think her story is is, is really touching. Like when you analyze it, what happened? Like the, the the fall of um, specific code of honor and so on and why it happened and so on and so yeah yeah i think i think rogue is like out of equation because it's it's a different different emotion attached to it yeah and uh, like tomek i also like <laughs> the characters i worked on the most so um and i like um, complex characters and um, um, it's quite easy to make you know like a likable character so um, i prefer this kind of complexity when, for example, you hate this character, but uh, during the game, you know, you start to like him. So that's the reason why I like Johnny Silverhand mm -hmm. um, and other 
characters I worked on, uh, like Joshua Stevenson from uh, Cinnamon, Cinnamon Quest. Um, uh, I also like Rogue, and um, I think it's, uh, I mean, she's like a um, minor character in the game, but she's uh, quite complex, and um, uh, I really like how many, like, an emotional content and, you know, um, stuff is uh, contained in this character, which is minor. Mm -hmm. uh, from The Witcher, um, Ciri, um, I, I, yeah, I, I really like her. Geralt is an obvious choice. <laughs> um, That's okay. the easy choice. Yeah, yeah. He's okay. okay. He's fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah but, but I really like Ciri. It wasn't um, that obvious, you know, how sh we should um, write her. And it came out that she's a good character. Mm. I like uh, Olgerd von Everett from oh, uh, Hearts oh, yes. of Stone. Yeah, I remember writing this quest uh, and I really enjoyed it. Um, Bloody Baron, obviously, the same case. Someone, you know, a little bit shady character and you hate him or you love him. Oh, my, maybe that's not the case. Maybe John is more like this <laughs> character, love or hate. Bloody Baron, maybe you... Um, uh, I don't know, like, but you can uh, empathize with. Yeah, exactly. you try to yeah. understand them yeah. at yeah. some point. Yeah, yeah. 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 But still, uh, I have complex NPC, and um, I, I think it's a, um, it's a very nice character. And from uh, The Witcher One, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I really like um, the Shani, and oh. actually, that that was the reason why she uh, came back in uh, Hearts of Stone because I I, I really enjoyed this character. Mm -hmm. Oh, I I didn't actually to be honest I didn't uh, I really like Shani and I love the Hearts of Stone part uh, and the relationship with Geralt but I didn't feel that the decision was forced it was actually natural yeah uh, it was really nicely done to be honest really so. Yeah. Uh, Okay, uh, the thing that I love uh, about what you said, guys, uh, regarding complexity of the characters is because uh, I'm a huge fan of Olgerd, for example, Jackie Wallace. Uh, I, like, I, like, uh, I like also John and many characters I can relate to you here, with you here. Uh, but when it comes to the complexity, I, I think uh, what I love the most is that uh, whenever I meet the character again, I feel that there is some change to happen over let's say that the, the time that I haven't talked to them uh, or and 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 this is one thing and the second thing that this is this second side of the coin which is as you said it's kind of easy let's say to make a character likable but it, it doesn't make him complex and complex means that there is also as let's say dark side of the character trauma whatever that that help the audience let's say to get into the relationship because yeah. then they are really human beings and I'm wondering what's your take on let's say even planning this complexity of the characters uh, maybe you could give us a little bit about the process some hints here uh, when it comes to complexity making a character really really not even likable just like that but 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 a living character uh, because I think it's complex uh, super tough uh, to make it Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, uh, I don't know, we can talk about Johnny or um, Joshua from Cinnamon, but it's almost the same case. So you have a story and you know how the story progresses and you have some scenes uh, and you know how it begins, how it ends and you have the, obviously the middle, uh, the middle part and um, then your job is to make this character dynamic. So you um, plan how to reveal to the player um, what kind of character this person is. So let's talk about uh, Joshua Stevenson from Cinnamon. So at the beginning you know that he's a mystery and you are intrigued. So you get this quest and you start to travel with him. Then you start think, uh, you, then you learn that he's a convict. Then you learn that maybe he's crazy. <laughs> then uh, you learn that maybe he's actually not crazy, but uh, actually he's someone, mm, you know, who who is um, mm, repenting, who, you know, uh, that his conversion was uh, true. And then again, 
uh, you think that maybe he is crazy <laughs> because he has this outburst. Then you uh, meet his victims and you again start to think about him as a convict. And then you have this moment when uh, you learn that he's actually exploited by corporation and then you empathize with him. Mm -hmm. And then you have this final decision and um, everything you've learned in this quest, everything you felt in this quest is at the table. So it's up to you to choose what we are going to do right now. And that's the moment you are, you know, for this moment you are building up all this setup and then the player have to choose. And if it's well done, you know, the player doesn't know to do what to do. He stops playing the game. He starts to think. And then we know that it's mm -hmm. a success. Yeah. It's, it's a cool. great example because it's one of those characters yeah. that you, I, I, for example, when I played the quest, I had to like put down the gamepad and I had to think about it. And, and, and I think that's the kind of thing you want to, you want, that's the reaction you want. It was a heavy player. breathing, you know, I yeah. had to leave the pad and heavy breathe. Like, yeah. And um, there's a lot of characters like that yeah, where yeah. you kind of don't know, or you do something and you stop playing that quest yeah. and then you start thinking about it and, and like going through like the motions. Okay. This, that. Is he good? Is he bad? What should I have done? Should I have done this? Should I have answered this? Should I have done like, like the branching of the whole yeah. thing just makes it even more crazy because it, it, and I think that's the way that it like gets embedded into your brain, right? Exactly. And like through this actually methods, let's say it makes you really engaged into this yeah. relationship. So in the end, it's actually about player agency because you let me choose, but I don't know what to choose, but I have everything on my plate and I can choose, but I don't want to, but I have to, like, you know what I mean? It's a mix of, uh, it's a very like an emotional cocktail. Yeah. And, uh, but you don't have to progress and because this is life, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Live, you have yeah. to progress. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, the, the really cool example. Yeah. And also the character is not being flawless. I feel like yep. this is something that I like because sometimes we have this vision of when you're creating a game and you're creating like protagonists or characters or side characters that they're these like grander figures that can do no wrong. They're awesome. They're badass. They kind of come and swing in, you know, they can, they can fight, they can do everything, but they have flaws. And I feel like we as humans, we're kind of like incentivized to look at things which are flawed because we know we ourselves are a little bit, you know, we're not perfect, right? Yeah. Well, so this, that's what makes them more relatable, right? Exactly. Flaws are the most interesting part of every character. Like exactly. Like, fuel, say, so yeah. like, basically, yeah. this is what I look for in, in, in characters. Like, I can give an example. I, I think maybe I can add some things from the like structure, structural level of, mm -hmm. of what it means to achieve it, to achieve it, because uh, uh, I think it boils down. Uh, it's more complicated, but let's simplify it to, to three things. The first is the the character arc. Characters are as interesting as the problem they need to face, and as big the change. Not in terms of the spectrum of emotions, but how deep the change is for them that they are faced with. So, for example, you've got a character who needs to rise up to being a leader, and and that character either fails or not. So basically you, you face a character with a change on deep, deep emotional level. And th this change is what's interesting about the character. The second thing would be the conflict. The conflict that fuels the scenes and that fuels, that give us the fuel to write the, the plot basically. And every good scene has to include a conflict. So basically that character may have internal internal conflict, but external conflict is also, also important. So basically you need to, to show the journey of the character throughout many conflicts and, and to show how the change actually happens. And this is why you started with the change. You said that you see the change in the characters because this is what makes them interesting. And the, the last part is uh, what makes them believable, what makes them relatable and so on. I think this is the, the part which is uh, often... Mm, like, like not many people get it. Uh, I see it often m misinterpreted in many ways. You need to get rid of all the props. Characters are never interesting because of their props, of their weapons, of their style of fighting, of their look, of their clothing. Uh, they are interesting because of the things that, yeah, that are relatable. And uh, because you see the, the final product as a character being a final product, you think that this character is cool because of the iconic third or a gun or a jacket or whatever. And it like on an unconscious level, it works, but but basically when you start to analyze, characters are interesting because, for example, they are someone's son and you are also someone's son and you've got 
similar pro problems. Uh, they are interesting because they they are living through things that are similar to our things. And even if they live in a cyberpunk world where there is cyberspace and they've got Chrome arm or whatever, it doesn't really matter because the problems they are facing are pretty much the same problems, the same, but for example, pushed into the extreme. Yeah. But on the almost emotional level, you can relate to you whatever relate to they that. are going yeah. through. Yeah. Yeah. And um, actually, I said before that there are many ways to craft a story and in our stories, um, characters are very important. But what Tomek said um, reminded me about uh, our, like, uh, pillar, our main rule um, when we are um, creating our stories, because um, all games uh, created by CD Projekt uh, are about um, human in uh, extreme condition and about testing humanity. So uh, in cyberpunk, a V is about to die. So you are a human and what we are going to do if you know that you are dying. Um, in Witcher series, it's about, you know, being a decent man in a cruel world of war, uh, you know, diseases, uh, monsters, yeah, monsters yeah. exactly. So um, we have this um, humanistic approach and we are always telling, you know, about human condition and that's like a fundament of our stories. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> totally. Uh, regarding props, uh, because... Uh, you, you just reminded me something, and you've mentioned Damien from from Blood and Wine, and uh, and then we at the beginning we said Story is a King, and then the props needs to kind of complement the, let's say a characteristic motion, uh, a root of each character, and I remember that we he was a very loyal and very brave dude, uh, and like supporting Henrietta as for example. And then his prop was, let's say, that we've changed his appearance because he was attacked and he had the scar on yeah. his face. And and on, so I really like it because it really is a good example because it's a, actually secondary character, but all the props and all the change was, uh, first of all, kind of well-crafted, designed from the beginning, but also was supporting his main role in a game and his role, like being still okay I'll, i i got wounded but i will i'm loyal at the same time i will never uh surrender um, I, I don't think it's said anywhere in the game but we assumed that he is secretly in love with her but because I he's not an, yeah. and and because he's not an aristocrat like it's impossible for him to even imagine that that could have happened so that I think there's one moment when she is like she she states that she's gonna be in grave danger and so on and she just he just looks at her and in that like if you know what to look for in that look you see the the depth of the relationship and and it's, it's super subtle I don't know how how transparent it is but like we we always remembered about him being uh, like basically willing to give his life for her if if needed yeah. Yeah, and I'm also happy that you mentioned Anna Henrietta because she, for me, was was she kind of broke my idea of what a typical ruler would be. Like she, I still remember my favorite scene from Blood and Wine is uh, after the um, uh, the Cherny fight with the with the Shelmar, um, when they go to the to the castle where she rips off her skirt, like gets on the horse and just like bolts, and it's it's totally one of these things where it's like. Yeah, like take this and and goes, and then her help is like holding the skirt, and there's a, like a, there's like a peasant looking like, wow, she actually did that. So it's like it, it breaks kind of your your idea of what a typical ruler should be, right? Yeah, I love it because when story pitched this idea, we're like, like really thinking like like a week at least how to handle it from the technical and animation yeah. point of view. Like this is like it was a tough challenge then. Um, uh, right now it would be easier, but you know, we've never made like clothing, uh, that time, the uh, clothing, um, uh, like ripped on screen, yeah. uh, because of many, many, many issues behind, behind, right. Yeah. But it was great. And it built up the character so much. It's, it's memorable for yeah. you. You yeah. see, it's stuck. Uh, exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, because we, we said, um, we, 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 we are discussing about this like deep emotional layer, talking about protagonists, 
main NPCs, they are true emotions, they are true human beings. We say they are, they ha they are they're having a flaw, they have a conflict, and it's and it's definitely very grounded. Uh, but there is also fun because we also there is this uh, of course flow characters are <laughs> very fun yeah. to write and 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 create. But still, then there is a moment with all the productions we are having that to add a like fun fun factor. And we're having those side NPCs that we are not even able to get to know them that very, really deeply and closely, but uh, but we're trying to have some Easter eggs, uh, some fun stories, uh, and just to twist this let's say noir vibe in Night City uh, or this dark fantasy grounded cruel world in Witcher Three. And I'm wondering, like, how do you like the process and uh, what's our favorite parts uh, regarding this small but funny moments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we're talking about Easter eggs and, uh, you know, all, the, all those tiny, uh, funny things in the game, um, the thing is that you, you cannot really plan it. So it's not like that we have a list of Easter eggs and we make them. It's always, uh, let's say that uh, you're making a game and it's like a fourth year and you are really tired and mm -hmm. then you have this <laughs> idea and then you cannot stop yourself from, you know, like making it. And that's how uh, mm -hmm. Easter eggs in our games uh, mm, start. And uh, sometimes, you know, this idea is so good that, you know, some other people join you and um, something, you know, spectacular, uh, uh, you know, uh, emerges. Um, and uh, to be honest, my favorite, like uh, those tiny um, little funny things, those Easter eggs are still a secret. And as far as I know, they are not discovered yet. And they are really, nice. really tough to to discover. So uh, I, I won't talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I feel like it's always something like this. Like people sometimes discover things after a couple of years. Like I remember there was for Witcher 3, someone discovered something like seven years later. So there, there are little little hints and things. And, and, and we know that there are players who play our games and other games like multiple times back and forth, back and forth, and they try to pick up on these things, but not everything can be always found, which is which is the, the cool part. But I like that, you know, it's something that you add in kind of through the process. So it's like iterative process, like we talked. So once you're doing something, you're kind of like, ah, maybe let's, let's, let's squeeze something here. And then having others come in and, you know, and also collaborate on it is, is yeah, cool. Yeah. It really shows the team effort on that. Yeah. The funny thing is like, like half of developers don't know about Easter eggs. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I was like also experiencing something that I have no idea about, right? <laughs> and that's actually fun. That's okay. That this is one of the most difficult questions for me because uh, I, I don't really like them that much. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's problematic. I know. I used to like them a lot. Mm -hmm. I think I, I don't know why, but I lost it somewhere along the way. Uh, I love the small glimpses of the like of the world, like unexpected okay. background talks like what happened and, and you, you think that it maybe doesn't fit but yeah it does and and like you, you're being caught off guard by either um something which is written and in, in one, like you know, one of the computers on in a letter and or, or or you have a funny conversation or interesting conversation that seems not to make sense but mm -hmm. then it does those i like a lot uh easter eggs uh, i think that they, they can easily be overdone uh yeah. and um, they for for me, sometimes uh, it's a low hanging fruit, basically, yeah. because it's easy to connect the dots for you as a developer and put something funny and interesting. But it would be more challenging to actually come up with something which comes out of the world, like mm -hmm. out of I don't know Night City, and put something equally as interesting. And I like to challenge myself uh, not to go get for the go for the low hanging hanging fruit, mm -hmm. but to go for something which is. I think for most people, much more boring. And like, I, I know that. And I know why people love Easter, Easter eggs. As a player, I love mm -hmm. fi finding them. As a as, as a creator, they, they are not my favorite thing, to be honest. So you, I'm a popular opinion, but this mm -hmm. is how it is. But do you also think that maybe it's because they kind of break the fourth wall in some sense? Like they kind of fit into the world, but they are taken from something which is happening in our, let's say, real life. 
and that these things they should kind of there should be a line where these things shouldn't go into the the, the story and you want to keep the story pure I, I don't think it's about keeping it pure i think that sometimes it's just uh... Yeah, it breaks my immersion at some point. Not every. That not, was my not, second not, follow-up. Not, like not, immersion. Not all of them. Not all of them, of course. Not all of them, because uh, some of them are just pure fun and cool. Mm -hmm. And then there's place for everything. And, and don't get me wrong. Like I think that like, there is a proper place for like huge amount of Easter eggs. But sometimes, just sometimes, I encounter something which I just think that it shouldn't be there because it instantly moves my direction towards some piece of pop culture I've, I've decoded mm -hmm. instead of being here and there in the story and and f yeah it, it bothers me as a, as a player it bothers me even more as a, as a creator mm -hmm. I'm boring I'm boring yeah. I'm sorry so I have a, a reason uh, I mean uh, because I like them and there is a reason why I like them uh, I mean one reason is obviously that I like funny stuff <laughs> uh, but we all uh, do. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that's why we are here uh, but another reason is that um, it's like a way for the developers to directly you know connect with the player uh, and not through the game you know not through the um, story in our case but you know but something by something more personal so for example I like let's say Doctor Who and I make a Doctor Who Easter egg in the game, and it it is something you know from my heart to mm -hmm. the players, and some of them won't like it. That's obvious, but some of them will, and that's like a personal connection. It's like um, reading those uh, medieval manuscripts. There are those marginalia. You mm -hmm. know, the monk was copying a manuscript, and uh, on uh, on the margin there is written that oh it's cold today or or, <laughs> or the, there is a personal touch yeah exactly yeah, yeah. like a funny picture so uh, you know it goes through the time and it sometimes it's um, I mean um, sometimes it doesn't really fit um, this original product like the game but it is a way to connect to the player mm -hmm. totally. Um, okay, so that was the follow-up. Your favorite site, 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 NPC, and why? Oh, wow. <laughs> because those are all about, like, most often. Like, for example, you 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 get to know Jesse Cox with Mr. Stud. And you know what I mean? Like, for me, it's funny because... It's a, it's a, it's it, a cool quest line. <laughs> especially, it's a cool quest. It's funny. Uh, animation supports it. Uh, yeah. it. So it's even funnier. And then I can even recall my sessions when I was like 12 years old playing pen and paper cyberpunk. And I remember such moments, you know what I mean? So it's it's simply the funniest NPC for me, Sci 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 NPC. And do you have like anything, anyone? Yeah, for me uh, in The Witcher, all trolls. Mm -hmm. mm, uh, in cyberpunk, uh, I really like... Um, I mean, there is this retrospection, this flashback, um, when uh, Johnny, uh, back in the days, is um, attacking Arasaka with his team. So I really like all those people in this team, mm -hmm. um, and I like uh, the flow between them. Like pure archetypes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Okay, so uh, that's a difficult one. That caught me off guard. I don't know if I've got... I, if I've got one in The Witcher, like I've got one, but I worked on this character, so I, I may, it's more like a liking an idea. Uh, you've got a quest, which ironically is a big Easter egg because it's a quest about the bank, which is an Easter egg from Asterix. Love it. Uh, me not liking but Easter eggs. You being, did it. Yes, I did. It, yeah. So I'm a big hypocrite. Like <laughs> I, can, I can't help it's it. It's legendary. Yeah, mm. it was back in the days. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> my my taste changed. Yeah. But basically, but yeah, I, I love that quest because I like Asterix and I understand the process here. Uh, and yeah, there's this guy. I think he's sitting in the basement, which you won't, you you can try to bribe and. He's really flattered, but he cannot do anything. So basically, that's very cool that you want to give me money, but I can't help you. Even if I want it, like, it's impossible. So uh, I, I found that one funny. And, and, and Cyberpunk is the one I haven't, like, uh, that is not my idea. Uh, when Jackie is dead and there's a friend there, 
there is a guy uh, who is reading a message sent out of prison because of respect. And there is this guy who's, who's like, who brings the message from the Valentino's leader, leader currently being in prison. And he reads, uh, he, he reads basically the condolences from, 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 from a piece of paper. Uh, it wasn't my idea. I found it really romantic that basically <laughs> they, they sent a guy with a card to, to read the condolences during the uh, gangster's funeral, basically. That's a good one too. Yeah. That's a really good one. Nice. Nice. Um, I have a question that kind of um, is, is, is going to be a curveball because we, we didn't have it in the script. How is it when you're working on a text that like, on, you know, you're working on a story that has been kind of solidified in text? I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, we're, we're looking at The Witcher. A lot of books written by Andrew Sapkowski. A lot of inspiration, a lot of things. I know we build on the story. I know we add characters. I know we take it in a different direction. But how does that compare when you have, like, a, let's say, a set of guidelines and rules compared to the world of cyberpunk where I feel like there is more freedom? Do you, Are you the less freedom or more freedom? Probably more freedom, but I want to hear your take on it. Mm, well, it depends, I think. I, I think I'm less freedom. Uh, but it also um, comes from the way I play games, for example. I know it's uh, it might be weird, but when I play any game, I do not imagine I'm the character. I use a character as a as a vehicle to to tell an interesting story with. So, for example, when doing something which is bad, like more mor moral wise, which is bad, I, I don't feel bad because this is my character doing that. And for example. I'm role playing the the fall of someone who has flaws, and for me, the choices that are the most interesting story wise are the right choices to take. Even though, for example, and then the most cohesive ones, of course. So I prefer to have the story that is being told to me as a player, so, and and I think this is also why I don't uh, mind the constraints in, in the process and so on. Because uh, basically, when you know what to follow, you basically try to 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 fit the directions and so on. Mm. And for me, it's mm, not such a big difference be because um, um, every time we adapt something like Witcher or like um, pen and paper cyberpunk, um, the first thing I do is like analyze what I have and I, you know, uh, uh, I analyze it and I separate all the elements. And then uh, I know that I have to mm, craft a story using those elements but in my head they are not connected they are like you know like separate entities mm -hmm. and then i um, check what i need and then i reuse them and then i check if they fit and if it's still if it's still witcher like mm -hmm. in the source material and usually it is because uh, we know our source material really well oh, yeah. and yeah and uh, that's how it goes yeah, I remember I, I asked you once something about when we were working on Thronebreaker about something about Northern Realms and how um, they came to be, like how was like Lyria and Rivia, and you could like tell me with with dates, like historical dates, like things that happened. I was like, how can he know that? But that's what that's what you said. Like you know your source material very well, so it's much easier to pull from the sources the things that you need in order to build a cohesive story. And then you go back and you also check, okay, does this apply to what The Witcher is? Incredible. So the follow-up is the source material and analyzing it's one thing, but there is also the second thing, which is an inspiration, which is your fuel. And, you know, like you as creators, like you probably you're stuck at some point sometimes, and probably you need somehow to really um, like a spark. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, like, what's the way of, let's say, Re remove these creative roadblocks uh, in, in front of you. Like, how do you inspire the teams uh, that that you that you lead uh, and yourself? Uh, it's a more inspiration. It's more about let's say your discipline you kind of uh, created over the years of of producing, creating games. Uh, and I think it's 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 gonna be interesting for people. So for me, it's easy. I mean, uh, I'm easily bored. <laughs> so uh, every time, uh, I mean, uh, when if when we finished uh, like uh, The Witcher Three, okay, so our next uh, expansion will be a horror because uh, we need some uh, something different, and we finished House Hearts of Stone, so okay, now our 
Next expansion will be in this colorful realm, full of knights and co courtly love, and you know, with eccentric, uh, ex eccentric queen. And uh, it goes like this. So um, it's about you know, like thinking out of the box and uh, looking for um, sometimes um, you know weird inspirations because it is always challenging for your brain you come up with inspiration oh, oh let's make a, a horror in the witcher and then you start to you know develop it and you try to connect the dots and then you produce something unique mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think for me it is oh it's gonna sound like a cliche but the, the real world and uh, obviously, you need to know your genre. Like we are doing fantasy, so you need to know the like the the, the biggest cornerstones of the of fantasy as a genre. You need to like know the the classical books and all all the stuff that basically formed the the fantasy as we know it today. Uh, but and there is the big but uh, when you're writing an actual story, uh, I really uh, push for writing characters who are uh, similar to us and i think that the the way to do so is to understand the, the actual processes that drive people not only psychologically because we spoke a lot about emotions but i'm going to give you an example from phantom liberty for example uh, we know that we are doing a spy thriller but like if i asked you what's like typical day of a spy how do you recruit a spy you would give me like I'm not judging, but basically we we know how it's done in the movies. We know how it's done, maybe in the books, but there are different layers to it. Like the first layer is everyone saw a James Bond movie, and everyone knows what James Bond does when there is a secret weapon developed on the other side of the world. He needs to go there and secretly destroy it, steal it, you name it. Like this is what happens. Then you've got another layer, like you know the genre, like you saw many movies about spies, so you saw different versions of that. The trope, but then you start reading the uh, the best books about spies. Uh, so, for example, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, and this is not only about spies themselves, but and also written, I think, by a former spy. But basically, this is also about the psychology, about the cabin fever, about second guesses, and so on. But then there is another layer. You start to research the actual uh, documentaries about what happened back in the days, whatever is available to you you start to understand how the real recruitment process goes and, for example, what is the, the real operational work as, as much as you can. And then there's another, you take a step back, step back and then you'd create a character who has to live through what you know and then you try to understand what does it do to people. And that is an example of a spy, but you do the same with the gangster, you do the same with the, uh, with, I don't know, a, a, a boxer going to the ring. Like you need to understand the process, what makes this character real. And then you add, of course, the whole emotional layer. But when whenever I try to find inspiration, I look in the stuff that is real and stuff that is basically um, mundane for, 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 for extraordinary individuals, because everyone has their mundane stuff. And I try to research as much as possible. Uh, so yeah, reading a lot of fact, like like l less fiction, more more fact based things, and 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 try to get as as much knowledge as I can, and this is which, keep, which keeps me running basically whenever I try to write a story. So like a deconstruction of things. Like, of course, I'm very analytical. I yeah, yeah. I can't help that. I, I mm -hmm. de deconstruct things to the okay. smallest to the, to the like the smallest pieces, and then I try to. But everything yeah. has its own law. Yeah, like Mar Martin also mentioned about. Blood and wine being, let's say, colorful with errant knights and with eccentric Henrietta and stuff. It, it fits some some genre. It fits some idea. Same with horror with Hearts of Stone. There is always also always some laws, right, Be, behind, uh, below. Uh, you you said about laws uh, when it comes to the profession. Let's say, yeah, spy. And I really like the the like like going deeply into yeah. the subject. Uh, it's pretty pretty inspiring. Makes it very raw, like yeah, very yeah. real. And like yeah, and very it's, real. it's because yeah. we always think that yeah, games. It's all about you know, yeah. woo, it's like out of this world. But no, it's it's actually it's rooted in something that should be real. And this also brings us back to something that we discussed uh, previously, just this relatability and reality of the whole thing because we can relate it because. It's real, right? It's not something that was pulled out of a hat. It was something that actually happened in real life. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah. I also thought that there was just going to be like a mandatory reading list in the, in the narrative team. Like you need to read these books in order to, to, to do this. Is this, is this a thing or not? I mean, if we're working on Witcher, right? You need to, you know, you need to know the, the books, right? Or should this also be, are you also looking for people who come in with, let's say a fresh idea, like when you're constructing a team, like I want to know a little bit about this process. Mm, I mean, in the story team, we are all huge readers, so uh, it's quite easy to, you know, to refer to something. You just drop a title and more or less everybody knows what you are referring to, uh, so it's quite easy. <laughs> yeah, I would say that was one of the, the greatest parts of being here for the first few years because, you know, I, I, I was a newbie, like basically. Uh, I started as a junior and I remember whenever someone dropped the title I didn't know the first thing to do was like I was too shy to ask so so you, you quickly put a note on your phone to check it later and the first thing to do was to, to read it and to, or to watch it and to check what it is about so one week later you're already in the circle and you know what's happening and that's a that's a great for development like for personal development like I learned the tones just listening to people listening what they do how they deconstruct as you mentioned stuff how they like tiptoe around ideas using different references but if you don't know them like quickly read them watch them and and then you grow exponentially so that's very cool cool awesome cool 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 uh actually i have a question because we talk all all, all about like creation and stuff but there is also the second part of it which is managing the team and how do you build a story team uh, you just said that it's great to have common like you know writers read like that's great and i think it it it, it, it should be this way but uh, how do you manage this creative you know powerhouse yeah like <laughs> it's not easy right especially i believe that uh, in the red there is this kind of chaos factor which is which is great but you don't want to templatize things yeah because as soon as you templatize it, it it's not creative enough it's not innovative enough uh so it makes it actually from the you know even more difficult right so how do you manage how do you uh like even learn from each other in the, in the team how do we do that mm. <laughs> um i do it by uh hiring uh mature and well-educated people that know how to work together and then I let them do what they want to do uh, as far as it's in line with that. what we are yeah. doing. Nice. <laughs> nice. Wikipedia definition. You, pre you prepared. Yeah. <laughs> you can, no, no, you can but, prepare. But nice. letting nice. them do what they want yeah. to do is, uh, is yeah. a big factor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and this yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of plays into the chaos, yeah, yeah, yeah. but exactly. it's chaos, exactly. but it's in a, yeah. in, a, in a, let's say, managed yeah. way chaos, right? Yeah. Contained yeah. chaos. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's really true. Once the, the, the proper level of trust kicks in, so I'm, I'm sure that we are kind of aligned emotionally and and we know that you're heading the same direction at some point of the process with with specific writers uh i had the situation for example i was reviewing dialogues and i wasn't sure that like i wasn't sure if it's going to work but i i said okay i'm i'm going to go for it and i trust you let's try it mm -hmm. because it shouldn't be all about my taste or my choices uh the game is huge and it it contains so much stuff that may, maybe I'm wrong. And uh, those moments sometimes, like, it, it's 50-50 situation. But at the same time, whenever you're proven wrong, you learn something. And you learn something from those people. And it's also one of the greatest moments when, when you work with someone and you trust them enough to, to let them do their thing, even though you're not feeling at, at the level of review. But you know, for example, you've got time and the possibility to just go for, go for it and check. And then it resonates with so many people that they, for example, add uh, movement or some, some cinematic approach to it. Or you even like play it for fifth time or sixth time and it starts working for you and you learn something new about the craft and about yourself. Incredible, incredible. I can imagine that people in the comments are going to ask about your top 10 books after listening to this <laughs> podcast uh, that, 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 that inspires you the most, let's say. Uh, yeah. but, we, but we won't go into that. Like we won't, we won't make them list the top 10 books right now. <laughs> not, not, not now, not now. But we can make a separate podcast about oh. A book club. Yeah. A book club. Yeah. Book club. Yeah. 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 We need, we need okay. cigars and stuff. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> More relaxed. Exactly. Uh, I think we're very relaxed. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. so. 
Okay. Awesome. I think that's 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 our episode right now. Yeah. So guys, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for sitting down with us and going deep, but also talking about your inspirations and also how we do story and uh, into the Project Red. So it was awesome having you in the studio. And uh, thanks for having me. Us. Us. Obviously, yes. Mm -hmm. thanks thank you, guys. Thanks it was a lot. Fun. It was the first one, which sets up the demo, demo, right? Exactly. We'll be so, moving on from that. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks a thank lot. you all. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We hope that you enjoyed as much as we did. And guess what? We just scratched the surface because today we covered only narrative, but there are more to come. We want to cover all development process related to our games. Exactly. And this is like Sebastian mentioned, only the beginning. So we want to hear from you guys. We want your feedback. We also want comments. We want also ideas in terms of guests that you would like us to invite here to the studio. And also, uh, depending where you're watching or listening to this, remember to comment, like, subscribe and all that jazz. Uh, so we know if you're liking the content that we're producing and we'll see you in the next episode.